Good day everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today is all about this guy, the Fujiwara Denka 210mm Gyoto. I had a chip on this bad boy, and today's video is going to show you and demonstrate how I removed the chip. If you like the content that's been coming up lately, please remember to like and subscribe. A special thank you for reaching 1,000 subscribers minutes before midnight, before 2022. I had a group of community members from the Japanese Made Knives group on Facebook come together and try to get me to 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. Lo and behold, around 2 a.m. when I was having some champagne and checking the tube, I saw I hit 1K, so thank you so much to everyone for your ongoing support. really means a lot and allows me to continue wanting to put out this content because I know you appreciate it. So this thank a little bit about this particular knife. This is absolutely my favorite knife in the collection. If I had to keep one knife out of all knives and I would get rid of every single other knife, I would keep this Thanka. It means a lot to me because it's a knife that I just absolutely love using. It's a size of a Gyoto that I find very comfortable to hold, that's very manageable, and it's also very useful just in terms of its length and its geometry being a Gyoto. The handle is one of a kind, it really resonates with me, it fits very well in hand. It's smaller than most of my other custom handles and I thought given the length and size of the knife that it would be too small, but turns out it's absolutely perfect. So you can imagine my surprise when I chipped my favorite knife out of the collection, how I felt. And I did what any sensible man would do. I went straight to the forums to see what people would advise me to do. Now I don't have a whole lot of sharpening experience. I'm an amateur at best when it comes to sharpening. I have the equipment, but I have a lot of knives and I don't sharpen them super often. To be honest, I won't sharpen unless the knives are dull or there's some type of aesthetic flaw that I need to fix, like a chip. And so I went to the forums and I showed everyone the picture of the chip, and I'll put that up here on screen. What you should know is the picture of the chip is basically, I took a picture of the knife, basically portrait style, and I must have cropped in two to 300 times magnification just so you could see the chip, that's how small it was. When I'd be looking at the knife, I could only see it, it was near the tip, I could only see it depending on the angle of the light, and there I could see that it was missing just a little bit of steel. So in terms of gravity of a chip, it wasn't a large chip by all means, because if it was a large chip, I would know what to do. But my question to the community was, given the size of the chip, do you think I can get away with using an everyday stone like a 1000 grit to remove the chip? And the consensus was yes. I was told that because the chip is so small, you can even call it almost a microchip to be honest, that just passing the knife on a 1000 grit stone, working one side, building the burr, switching over to remove the burr on the other side, switching over a few times back and forth would eventually remove the chip. Now, let me show you what I have in front of me and then I'll tell you how it went. So of course, in order to sharpen a knife, I need to get rid of my cutting board because there's no use in sharpening my knife on the cutting board. And so what I have in front of me to be comfortable is, of course, I'm going to be using the stone that I talked about. This is a 1000 grit Shapton glass stone. I absolutely love it. To keep things stable, use the Naniwa rubber stone holder. Now I could be working just directly on the counter, but I'm a bit of a neat freak. And so I don't want any of the slurry or any water on the counter. So what I did instead is I like to basically take a tea towel and just put it underneath a baking pan, grab the stone holder, put it on the baking pan, put the stone in its place. Of course, I would secure that as opposed to just having it lay flat on top. And there you go. Now when I grab the water bottle and I spray the stone, doesn't matter whether it's water or slurry as I'm working the knife, it just falls straight into the pan, a little bit like a drip tray, and I'm good to go, everything stays clean. Now, of course, this is a stone where it doesn't clog very easily, but of course, just in case it does clog, that's where the Nagura stone comes in. When the stone starts to get clogged, kind of just rubbing it in a clockwise or counterclockwise motion doesn't really matter, but you can see how the stone helps pull some of the particles that are stuck within the stone right out, and now you have a clean stone. Always remember to flatten your stones before using them, now, depending on the type of use that you put on your stones, you don't need to be sharpening every single time, but I highly recommend at least every three to four uses of your stone, or again, depending on your practice. And so that is the main setup that I'll be using to remove the chip out of the knife water bottle. What I'll do as a finishing step, you'll see coming up, is I have this leather strop from Nordquist Designs. If you're wondering what the white cream is on the strop, well, that is... Rick's White Lightning 
compound. This is what I use as a scropping compound. It's basically aluminum oxide suspended in cream as opposed to wax. A lot of the compounds that you'll find for your strop will be suspended in wax and the downside to that is a little bit like a stone can get clogged just by the shards of steel being removed from your knife. So too can a waxy compound sometimes start to get stuck in the leather. With it being a cream and with Rick using as a diluter white vinegar instead of water, it's very easy to clean and it doesn't really affect the leather strop just by remaining on the strop. So this is what I use as my finishing touch. Now typically, with this Gyoto in particular, I like to use the Shibata-san method of sharpening, or at least ending the sharpening with a progression of 1,000 grit on one side, and I like to finish on the other side with 6,000 grit. Apparently, in practice, I've been told, and I have noted it to work very effectively, but I've been told that by finishing with one side on 1,000 grit and the other side on 6,000 grit, you end up with a feel of the knife, the edge of the knife being both toothy and silky. So it's great for something like a tomato or it's great for something like a pepper and a potato. So it's supposed to add more versatility to the edge of the knife. Let me know in the comments below if ever you've used this combination sharpening of finishing the edge of your knife on one side, higher grit and on the other side, lower grit. I've tried it and it seems to be very effective. But for the purposes of this video, again, I just really wanted to remove the chip and see how many passes it would take, left, right, left, right. And so I actually stopped with a 1000 grit stone. So the edge of this knife is 1000 grit, with of course it being stropped on this leather block. Now, spoiler alert, I'll let you know before you even see the footage. It did work. I removed the chip successfully, but it wasn't as quick as I thought it might be, right? The whole idea of asking, do you think I can use a 1000 grit stone is because I don't want to remove more steel than is necessary if I stop down to something like a 500 grit stone, which I do own, by the way. And so I can tell you that probably because I don't sharpen very often, the first pass on both sides was lighter than I should have on a 1000 grit stone in terms of pressure applied. And so it took five passes, five passes of right, create a burr, swap, left, remove the burr, push it to the other side, that's one pass. It took five of these passes before the chip was completely gone and only then did I move on to the leather strop and compound. To make sure that the chip was fully out, a little bit like I did when I noticed the chip, I used this nifty little hand loop. Super easy to see any of the defects on the blade. Just hold it straight up to your eye and then bring the blade as close as necessary in the right type of light to see if any chips exist whether they're micro or not. Though of course, if they aren't microchips, then I would reckon you don't need a hand loop. But this has been very useful in order to determine how to improve my sharpening as well. Now, the reason you wanna move back and forth instead of just sharpening on the area that is affected by the chip is because this is a knife that has a 50-50 bevel, right? If we take a look at the edge geometry, you have the same angle on both sides, it's 50-50. If I were to just work specifically the area affected by the chip, what that would mean is I would at some point, once the burr is created, but I continue to sharpen the same side on the stone, I would be pushing more steel than is necessary on one side, therefore affecting the angle of the bevel and the geometry, which is why it's important to work. What I did is I worked the edge in unison from tip to butt, create that burr, flip it around, tip to butt. If I only work one affected area, again, I'm going to end up with a different geometry at the tip, near the affected area specifically, and that means that when I'm slicing something, it's just not gonna feel smooth. It's almost gonna wanna maybe pull to the left or right because it's no longer a 50-50 geometry. So you will see footage coming up. I'm very happy with the performance of the knife. I don't think I've ever done the Scott Towel performance knife cut test, but I did this time, as you can see, the edge can probably be a little bit sharper. But of course, I did the paper test as well, which yes, though in practice, it doesn't really demonstrate how sharp a knife is. I can tell you that I've used it on food and it's absolutely wonderful. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this instructional video. I know that you told me you wanted more knife knowledge videos. This is one of them. Enjoy the rest of the video and catch you guys next time.
So in conclusion, my big lesson learned is this. Next time I have a chip on a knife, if I can see it, even with a hand loop, chances are I'm just gonna use my shafting glass 500. Why? Because it's gonna be faster, right? I, I don't want to be comparing how many particles of steel I've saved in using the 1000 instead of the 500. I mean, sure, I could take the slurry, I can dry off the water, and then I can measure the dry compound, the steel that's left to see, did I really save any steel by using a 1000 grit stone? But that's beyond my expertise. It's also beyond my focus. I'm interested in Japanese kitchen knives and in learning to sharpen them properly. But clearly five passes might still have been unnecessary if using a Shapton 500, maybe after the first pass, I would have noticed I'm really close to getting that chip out and then I could have progressed to the 1000. So next time I see a chip, if I can see it, I'm gonna be using the 500. For this time, this was a fun little experiment. I did work the chip out, it took a little bit longer than necessary. But this knife right now is screaming sharp. The chip is out, which means the best part is it can get back to work. Thanks for watching and see you next time.